Hi there! Before designing and building other components of our curve tracer, it is essential to first develop a power supply unit that meets all the requirements of the device. This ensures that as we complete and test each component, we have a reliable power source available to operate it. In this second episode of the series, we will focus on designing, building and testing the power supply unit. Let's begin! The curve tracer we are about to build is designed to work with the components typically encountered in a hobbyist lab. As such, it won't require the high voltages found in professional grade curve tracers, those costly devices capable of analyzing vacuum tubes or industrial power semiconductors. To keep things practical, we will limit the device DC voltage range between minus 15 volt and plus 15 volt. Additionally, the power supply will provide a plus 5V to power an Arduino Nano, which will serve as the waveform generator. Here is the schematic of the power supply. On the far left, you can find the pin header where a transformer will be connected. This transformer will supply a dual 15V AC output, with a maximum power of 15V amps allowing us to drive currents of up to 500 mA into the devices under tests, or DUT. The AC voltage is immediately fed through a full wave rectifier, with the transformer center tap connected directly to ground. Capacitors C1 and C2 label the pulsating output coming from the bridge rectifier, bringing the voltage across their terminals to the peak value of the transformer's sine wave. Capacitors C3 and C4 filter out any remaining high-frequency noise on the positive and negative rails, ensuring a cleaner signal before the voltage regulation stages. The regulation of the plus and minus 15 volt rails is handled by this LM317 and LM337 voltage regulators. I choose these ICs over the fixed LM7815 and LM7915 regulators because they allow for fine-tuning of the output voltage, ensuring a precise symmetry between the positive and negative rails. If the regulated output voltage isn't exactly as needed, small adjustments can be made to resistors R5 and R6 to achieve a perfect voltage balance. Capacitors C5 and C6 Make sure that the reference voltage applied to the adjustment pins of the regulators remains perfectly stable. Diodes D1, D2, D3 and D4 protect the voltage regulators during power down, preventing damage when the voltages across capacitors C5, C6, C7 and C8 momentarily exceeds the voltage at the bridge rectifier BR1. The voltage divider formed by R1, R3 and R5 set the reference voltage needed for the LM317 to generate a precise 15V output. Similarly, resistors R2, R4 and R6 perform the same function for the LM337, ensuring accurate regulation of the minus 15V output. Capacitors C7 and C8 provide the additional stabilization, helping to maintain steady output voltages during sudden load changes that cause abrupt current variations. Capacitors C9 and C10 are included to filter out any high-frequency noise generated by the load. The pin header J2 provides access to the regulated plus 15V and minus 15V outputs from the power supply. Connected to the output of the LM317 regulator is the fixed LM7805 regulator, which supplies the 5V needed to power the Arduino NAN. Diodes D5 and D6, along with capacitors C11 and C12, serve the same protective and stabilization functions as their counterparts at the outputs of the plus and minus 15V regulators. Finally, the pin header J3 provides access to the plus 5V power supply for the Arduino Nano. Here is the top view of the PCB I designed using Fritzing. It's laid out on a single-layer copper-clad board. 
Since the auto-routing feature in Fritzing wasn't able to avoid generating numerous jumpers, I decided to try with manual routing. This approach allowed me to optimize the layout and reduce the number of jumpers to just two. Once the routing was complete, I used a laser printer to create the etching mask for both the copper and the silk top layers. The copper mask was printed as is, ensuring it would appear mirrored once transferred onto the copper plate. However, I had to mirror the silk layer before printing so it would align correctly on the top side of the PCB after transfer. For a detailed description on how to make a PCB with the help of a laser printer, please refer to the video link coming up right now in the top right corner on the screen. Here is the completed PCB. You can see the silk layer on the top side and the copper traces on the bottom side. I began assembling the components on the PCB starting with the resistors, soldering them two at a time, and trimming the excess leads after soldering them in place. Next I moved on to the diodes, making sure that they were correctly oriented with their reference bands aligned with the markings on the silk layer. The next step was installing the pin headers, however, after initially soldering the ones shown in this video, I decided to replace them with the screw terminal blocks. These are much safer for managing power rails, as they provide a more secure connection compared to pin headers, where loose pins could easily disconnect. After the temporary pin headers, I went on with soldering all the capacitors, both the electrolytic ones and the ceramic, onto the PCB. Following that, I installed the bridge rectifier. Then I prepared the voltage regulators by attaching their heat sink before soldering them in place. And right there I made a mistake, I accidentally installed the LM317 in the wrong orientation. Fortunately I noticed and corrected the problem before powering up the board and potentially causing damage. Always double check component orientation when soldering, whether it's diodes, transistors or integrated circuits, even electrolytic capacitors have polarity and installing them backward can cause them to explode, literally. After all the components were in place, I finished by soldering the two jumpers, which were clearly marked on the silk layer. I also applied a thin layer of solder over all the copper traces on the bottom side of the PCB. There are two benefits to doing this. First, it prevents the exposed copper traces from oxidizing over time, preserving their conductivity and mechanical integrity. Second, the added soldier provides extra thickness to the traces, which is especially important for those carrying higher currents. This technique is commonly used in computer power supplies, where traces must handle significant currents, though in such cases the solder layer is often much thicker than what I applied. Finally, I screwed the four standoffs in their respective holes at the corners of the PCB. They will later hold the board in place inside the enclosure that will house the complete curve tracer. With everything assembled, I tested the circuit by connecting it to the transformer that will be used for the final version of the device. Then I measured all the generated voltages, including the AC voltages from the transformer and the DC outputs from the regulators on the PCB, the plus 15 volts, the minus 15 volt, and the plus 5 volt. Now that the power supply is complete, we can move on to the rest of the circuitry, starting in the next episode. And we will start in particular with the waveform generator, the block on the left side of this diagram. The waveform generator will produce the voltage ramp used to polarize the devices under test, and it will also include a ladder or step generator to supply a voltage or current to the control pin of the DUT, if the device has one. And while getting ready for the next episode, I wish you all my happy experiments!